actually recorded. Is that the idea? Okay. Um, no questions about MASH. Well, great. The, uh, I, I, this is the first time I've seen the ad that says uh, I'm here to fight hunger. And uh, I didn't quite know what the premise of, the, uh, of this event was. All I know is that I was asked to be here in conjunction with World Hunger Week uh, specifically because of a, uh, a speaking engagement last week at the medical school here. Uh, at which I talked in conjunction with Dr. Davida Cody, who is a professor, professor of public health uh, at UCLA, about a trip we recently took to the uh, refugee camps in uh, Central America and some time we spent in Nicaragua. Um, so what I have to say to you uh, is fairly specific to that trip and fairly specific to that situation. I want to clarify a couple of things. First of all, I don't pretend to be an expert on either uh, Central America, refugees, hunger, or any of the, uh, any of the uh, subjects allied to that. But I believe very strongly in Jefferson's idea that the strength of this country is in a concerned and informed electorate. Uh, I do have some information as a result of my personal experiences um, both in the Central America and in Asia a couple of years ago in the refugee camps. Uh, I have had some personal experience with the political system in this country, and I'm happy to share whatever of that uh, I can and that you're interested in, uh, in hearing about. Um, the situation in Central America, most of you know something about, if no other way than reading the newspapers. Uh, there is a, an active revolutionary war going on in El Salvador, uh, there, is a, uh, success, there was a successful revolution waged in Nicaragua. There is the, depending on your point of view, there is a, uh, a revolution in place at this point in Guatemala. And um, a lot of people say an incipient revolution or other people say an active revolution going on in Honduras. The, uh, the situation, of course, is uh, complicated by the American government's relationships to these various countries um, and by the American press's reporting of the situation down there. We have uh, the, the attitude or the uh, uh, interpretation expressed by Secretary of State Haig and President Reagan, and we have the attitude or interpretation expressed by some of the people in this country who disagree with that point of view. Um, I can speak to some of that uh, for anybody who's interested. My own experience is that uh, two years ago I took a trip through the refugee camps in Asia in connection with, as was indicated, an organization called CONCERN, which deals on an international, non-political, uh, humanitarian basis with refugees in the third world, wherever they exist. Uh, they have now, CONCERN now has teams in the uh, refugee camps in Honduras, uh, which are primarily housing Salvadorans, people from El Salvador who have come out of their country as a result of the, uh, the warfare going on there. Uh, there is one small camp we visited that uh, supports uh, people from Guatemala. And when we went into uh, Nicaragua, it was strictly as observers because I wanted to see for myself what was going on down there and take a look at some of the uh, flap you may have heard about having to do with the Mosquito Indians uh, and their uh, status. Um, what I saw in Honduras is an interesting situation. The, America does not recognize people who have come out of El Salvador, I should say the United States, does not recognize people who come out of El Salvador as refugees because of the fact that the presumption is that they oppose the government in state. In fact, in El Salvador today, uh, they are considered subversives, uh, guerrillas, supporters of guerrillas, communists, whatever kinds of uh, terms you want to apply to them. And as such, they're not accorded by the United States the, uh, the, the status of refugee. Honduras, being a, um, an ally of the United States, the Honduran government feels the same way, and there are, they are therefore reluctant hosts to these people. The Honduran government and this government in place in El Salvador are allies. The Honduran government is uh, allied as well with the Guatemalan government. 
and all three of them are opposed to the current government in Nicaragua, which is the Sandinista government, uh, which was uh, the Sandinista army was triumphant in the uh, revolution there a few years ago. Um, an interesting sidelight to that is that Americans, the American, the United States, I'm sorry, they are Americans as well, and it's a, a difficult thing for me to get away from uh, that kind of reference. But the United States uh, government and the Honduran government does accord the status of refugee and the attendant support system to people who come out of Nicaragua, who do not support the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. Now, that's purely a political decision. The decision is they're on our side if they oppose the Sandinistas, and the people who come out of El Salvador are not on our side, in quotes. Now, that's the, that's the position of the Reagan administration and the State Department. The world uh, bodies, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees and the International relief agencies which operate on a, uh, which attempt to operate at any rate on a pu purely humanitarian basis don't make that distinction and therefore they support the refugees who come out of Salvador and the refugees who come out of Guatemala as well as the refugees who come out of Nicaragua. Um, when I was in Honduras, uh, what you see, what I saw is scenes every day that made me think of the movie Missing. There is a tremendous military presence in Honduras uh, supported by United States military advisors. Um, the Honduran army has checkpoints, uh, barricades on the, on the various highways throughout the country, and we were submitted to searches uh, probably eight or nine times during the time we traveled the highways there in and out of the refugee camps. And there's a kind of mostly unspoken hostility toward anyone who expresses sympathy for the plight of the refugee. If the refugees are communists or insurgents or subversives or whatever you want to label them, then people who care about them and treat them are the same. That seems to be the message, the implicit message at least, of the uh, Salvadoran, or the, I'm sorry, the Honduran authorities. In the camps, um, the, the plight of the Salvadorans is not as dramatic as that I found in Asia uh, with the Campuchian refugees uh, some um, couple of years ago, mostly because they are not uh, physically as deprived and physically as uh, debilitated as were the Campuchians who came out of a, a horrendous situation. That's not to say the situation in El Salvador is great, but at least the people aren't in, in most instances starving as a direct result of uh, famine or uh, anything else. What they are are political refugees. They've come out as a result of uh, bombings and strafings and machine gunnings and massacres on the part of the Salvadoran government. Uh, they are poor people, they're peasants, they are uh, workers, and they are... Um, I, I would give you a, a kind of thumbnail analysis that they're about 99 to 1 opposed to the present government in El Salvador and supportive of what they call the compañeros, the boys, the, uh, their friends who are the revolutionaries. Uh, these people are not Cubans and they are not Soviets, at least the people in the refugee camps, and they say that the people who are fighting this war are not Cubans and they are not Soviets and they are not Nicaraguans, they are their countrymen and women. The, uh, the people in the camps are... Uh, have a, have a tremendous kind of cohesive spirit and at the same time they are they are depressed about having to leave their country and about being in, under the control of a, of a, of a hostile force, uh, about being kind of without power in their own circumstance. Um, and yet there is this cohesiveness of spirit, this sense that they are representative of the people of Sal uh, El Salvador. The Guatemalan refugees we met were a more spirited group. They sang and they danced and they talked uh, in, in kind of high tones about their situation. And I'm frankly not sure just exactly what to ascribe that to, except there were fewer of them. There were only 500 Guatemalans in the particular camp we visited, as opposed to uh, probably a total of 15,000 Salvadoran refugees who had uh, been separated from families and had been uh, discriminated against for some period of time before they came out and since they've come out. Um, we traveled uh, subsequently, as I mentioned, to Nicaragua, and we talked to some government officials there. We were hosted by the Sandinistas. Uh, we were taken to a camp where the Mosquito Indians were resettled. 
Uh, we talked to some of the mosquitoes themselves. We had uh, our own interpreter with us, so we weren't given the party line, uh, at least beyond recognition. Um, the situation is, a, is an interesting one, and my, I think my overall impression from my time in Central America is that there are really two faces of the United States evident. The face of authoritarian military presence, the kind of oppressive military presence that's there on the part of the Honduran military, uh, periodically on the part of the Salvadoran military who come through the refugee camps and take out people that they consider to be subversives, take them back across the border to uh, God knows what. Um, and the, the bureaucracy, there is this kind of overwhelming, oppressive presence of, of, uh, of kind of authoritarianism and militarism that is one face of the United States that's evident to all who will look, and believe me, they're all looking. The other face of the United States that I found evident and most impressive was that of the young people like yourselves, who many of whom I met uh, happen to come from this area, it's a couple of them from UCLA's public health uh, department who are there as concerned individuals, allying themselves with uh, humanitarian agencies, um, volunteering their time, some of them three months, some of them six months, some of them a year, in the camps working with these people and giving, teaching them about sanitation and teaching them about medical uh, uh, ways, to, ways to deal with medical problems and teaching them to read and write in certain instances, uh, teaching them how to, uh, how to take care of themselves nutritionally. Now, these people are, in my estimation, the finest, in, in the, act in the finest traditions of America in that they represent you and I, people who are concerned and aren't bound by ideology and want to reach out a helping hand to people in need. And the people in Honduras that I met, the Salvadorans and the Hondurans, and the people in Nicaragua that I met who also have volunteer Americans there, a team of medical uh, personnel from Houston, uh, a, uh, a group of uh, kids from Georgetown University who took a year off and went down there and just have given their time to work in the campos in uh, Nicaragua. Um, uh, I can give you chapter and verse. There's a group from Texas who's down there building schools just on their own. They're a group of businessmen who decided that uh, contractors and construction people who decided that what they can do best is do what they know, and they go down into uh, the Central American countries and build schools. Um, that face of America, is of, of the United States, is, is there, and it's getting through to the hearts and the minds of the people. But I'm afraid that given the preponderance of the military mind, the preponderance of the kind of authoritarian ethic that's being promoted down there, uh, the struggle is a lopsided one. And we here who have the opportunity to find out about the truth of what's going on down there and then express our feelings, express our questions, express our opinions to our government, to put pressure on our government to see to it that what we, uh, what we export from here need not be mindless militarism and can in fact be humanitarian concern and can in fact be the, 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 the products of America that we are proudest of uh, really should be what our, what our government and what our country is uh, is known for, rather than being the merchants of death that so many people see us as being. Um, that's kind of a thumbnail analysis of my trip. Uh, rather than just preach at you, uh, let me ask for questions from any of you who have specific uh, questions in mind, or even general area questions in mind. There are a lot of different areas for us to know about down there. There's a religious um, uh, equation that's a very confused one. There's the uh, there's a question of simple poverty and there's the question of the political uh, manifestations of the American authoritarian presence and American policy. Uh, there are a number of areas that I'd be happy to get into more specifically but I don't know exactly what your concerns are so let me just uh, ask you if you have any particular questions that I can uh, that I can address. Yes. I think, the, yes, uh, the young lady asked what I think uh, people can do that's most effective, how to contribute to the struggle there, I think was her term. 
Um, what's, the, what's greatest about this country to me is the variety of talents, the variety of uh, strengths that's available in, in this extraordinary population we, uh, we contain. I think, what, I think what has to happen is that each individual has to look at what her or his capabilities are and then what of those capabilities you're willing to share and then share them. It's as simple as not smoking a pack of cigarettes and donating the money. It's as simple as not eating a meal or a day's worth of food and donating the money. Or it's as simple as uh, involving yourself in uh, political action here, involving yourself in writing, in, in writing letters to Congress people, in, in contacting your representatives. It's as, it's as simple as knowing what the issues are and dealing with them on a realistic basis rather than letting the... Uh, the political savants give you the answers. It's as simple as volunteering your time, if you're of a mind to volunteering your time, to go down there with a volunteer agency or to work here with uh, Casa Nicaragua or uh, CISPES, the, the Committee in Solidarity, in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, or any of the other organizations that are out here, Medical Aid to El Salvador. There are uh, dozens of agencies and organizations, some of them on the... Uh, on the uh, official establishment level and some of them kind of sub rosa, sort of uh, semi-supportive of the guerrillas. There are a lot of ways for people to get involved and, uh, and I don't want to limit it by telling you what ways there are. I want, to, I want to expand it by saying to you that whoever you are, you have capabilities that can be shared and can be tremendously valuable. We're talking about an area where 40% of the children don't live past the age of five they die of starvation, dysentery, uh, uh, parasitic diseases. We're talking about an area where, in, El, in Nicaragua, for example, up until a few years ago, 59, I think it was, percent of the people didn't know how to read and write. Now, as a result of a, uh, a program that's been uh, uh, somewhat publicized here, uh, uh, that, was, that was advanced by the Sandinistas, that's down to 12.9 percent that don't know how to read and write. Uh, there, is a, there are health brigades going out in Nicaragua now that are trying to do the same thing in terms of bringing a concern about health and bringing education about health out to the people, out to the populace. But there, it's almost unlimited what we can do. And I came back here with a sense that I wanted Mary, the American people to understand that they don't have to feel guilty about having Pac-Man machines and having all the food they want to eat and the clothes they want to wear and cars they want to drive and all the television that's available to them and all the leisure time that's available to them. There's no reason for us to feel guilty about that. We've created a wonderful society for ourselves. What we can do is appreciate what we have. Take a look at the time we have and the energy we have and be willing to share it. There is no reason for us to kind of close off from those other societies and assume that they want ours. And if anything we expand, we uh, give to them is somehow going to take away from us. None of that is the case. We have such abundance here that it's simply a question of sharing it. And in, in my experience, sharing it multiple, makes it multiply. Yes? That's one way to deal with it. Shouldn't we concentrate more here? That people can concentrate in, in any way they choose as long, in, in my estimation, What's important is being aware of the fact that there are people in need. I am particularly focused right now in Central America for two reasons. One is I was just there, and the other is that our, our government is raining destruction on the peoples of Central America with our tax dollars. I think that's wrong, and I think it's up to those of us who care about it to try and do something about that. I, ver I wouldn't argue with you in a m for a minute if you said that there was work that had to be done here. Certainly there are people who are hungry here. And... Uh, that has to be addressed in terms of the, if, no, if in no other way, in terms of the Reagan administration's priorities, uh, military services as opposed to human services. There are a lot of things to be done, and I don't think they're unrelated. What we have here in the United States, in, in California, uh, are a tremendous number of Salvadorans who, because they are not accorded refugee status, are, are here as undocumented aliens. We have, uh, uh, well... Yes, there are, there's a great many things to be done locally. Yes?
What would I like to see our government doing to change this equation uh, so that our focus isn't on militarism and is more on humanitarian concerns? Is that essentially your question? Okay. I am a fan of the United States of America. I think this is a great country and, and an extraordinarily powerful one. What I would like to do for us to do is take off the blinders and not lose ourselves in this, in this minute uh, area this kind of anti-communism mind block we've got that says that any insurgent, uh, any, any rebellious force anywhere in the third world must be uh, communist-inspired and must be responded to by us militarily. I think that's utterly false and stupid. I think it's, uh, it's restricting and inhibiting our best instincts. I think what our instincts are, are to, as this in young woman indicated, to go where there is need and give aid. We have now the American AID force is as suspected of being, whether or not it's true, is suspected by the people of these Central American countries as, of being in league with the CIA. That was true in Asia when I was there. They feel that everything that is handed out is handed out with a political IOU attached to it, and in many instances, I think they're right. What, what we can, what we have to give is, in the minds of all you people here, what we have to give is this joyous, exuberant youth and vitality that this nation possesses. What we have to give is extraordinary amounts of, of overproduced grain and, and, uh, and textiles. What we have to give is technology, positive humanist technology. What we have to give is uh, capability. What we have to give is uh, time and energy. Instead of being responsible for the support of the Somozas, and the, uh, and the militarist regimes in Guatemala and Honduras, and being, providing a, uh, a, uh, a kind of mindset on the part of the peasant in Latin America that says the U.S. government is that bird in the sky that's dropping bombs on us, or is that, mili that, that weapon that is in the hands of the dictator who is taking my rights away. Why should that be us? Why does that have to represent us? Yes. Sure. Yeah, the, 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 the opposition from the United States government comes in, uh, not official, I'm not important enough to have official opposition from the United States government, but uh, there was certainly a lot of official opposition when Ed Asner took his position in regard to uh, medical aid for El Salvador just as there was unofficial opposition, mostly from people who didn't understand that what we're talking about here is not communism versus capitalism. I talked to a priest down there who said, look, you've got hungry people who are trying to get out of their country because their government is shooting them, and they're coming across a river, and an American helicopter swoops down over them and machine guns them. Those people down there are saying, I don't know what the story is, but there are clearly two sides here, and I'm on their side. We've got revolutions down there that grow out not of communism, but grow out of poverty. And what we have to do is understand that poverty and communism are not necessarily synonymous, except when we, when we drive them into the arms of the ideologues. And we've done that, and there are certainly ideologues down there. I met a lot of people who espoused some ideas that I wasn't particularly thrilled with. But that doesn't mean that we have to decide it's black and white, that's on one side is the uh, is is all revolution, and on, one, and on the other side is all kind of uh, uh, in situ um, power. Yes. I thought I included that. Uh, uh, the gentleman indicated that I had said humanitarian versus authoritarian and, and that somehow the political was left out of it. Certainly, if we, if we believe in, in democracy here, if we believe and want to practice 
government of, by, and for the people, then we are responsible for the, for the decisions and policies that are carried out from Washington. What we have to do is involve ourselves as concerned citizens. If I've overused the word humanitarian, it's because it's something that uh, personally connects. But uh, voting is one thing, registering to vote, registering other people to vote, expressing our opinion. Uh, what's going to happen in California very soon is that the people of the state of California are, according to the polls, going to make a statement to the President of the United States and the Premier of Soviet Russia with regard to the mindlessness of, of nuclear weapons. That's a very important political statement, and it is political. And I think it's also humanitarian. I think that uh, activities, whatever the activities are, in support of the United States disengagement from El Salvador are a very important thing for you to take part in. I think that support for people in Congress who are advocating that very uh, 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 avenue is very important. And opposition to the points of view of those people in Congress who, who maintain that we have to be there to corral communism. I think there are very, very specific and very... Uh, clear-cut things for us to do on the political level as well as on the humanitarian level. And there are some uh, people here who have a particular religious turn of mind that should take a look at what that means, and not only to them but to the expressions of the, uh, of the religious community in uh, Central America and throughout the world, yes. Sacrifice is not something we're called upon to make in this country very often. Um, there are those who feel it's important and there are those who don't. I frankly don't care. If you're, if you're moved by the notion of letting people know how important it is that they're stopping eating or cutting down on their eating or cutting back on one serving of a given meal, uh, can somehow transfer itself into helping other people. I think that's Im an important area for you to, uh, to pursue. See, I'm not here to tell you what to do. All I'm here to say is I have seen things, and the things I have seen are not what my government tells me is going on. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to paint villains. I don't want to tell you that Haig is a bad guy or Reagan's an evil man. I think there are some very misinformed people running our government, and some very misinformed people in terribly powerful positions in our country today. And that misinformation in some instances is just blindside. In some instances it's probably intentional. Um, intentional because they haven't allowed themselves to look at the options. But I don't think that this country need be dictated to by fear. I don't think we need to be huddled in fear of that massive uh, communist conspiracy that riddles throughout the body politic in uh, in all the third world, because I don't think that's a, a fact. And I don't think that w it serves us, who have this extraordinary wealth of capability, to be dictated to by this kind of negativity. I think what we have to do is take a look at who we are and what we have to offer and offer it, and become again the, the, the hope of mankind as we have been in the past. Yes. Um, let me respond to that a couple of ways. First of all, I don't think there's any connection between the cancellation of Lou Grant and Ed's pronouncements on El Salvador. I don't subscribe to that theory, and it's at best a theory. Um, Ed spoke out. He, had, he, he did so, I think, with great courage, great personal courage, and there was uh, a, certainly a furor that was, that was the result of that. Um, my understanding of the situation is that the show was never a big hit, and it peaked in its third, or third year, maybe, and its ratings were sliding, and CBS was going to cancel it anyway. I think the most egregious aspect of this whole thing, too, actually, 
are that Kimberly Clark took the kind of cowardly position they did to pull away their sponsorship, but there were other people plenty willing to fill in that sponsorship void. Uh, the decision was made purely on a business basis by CBS, in my estimation, and not uh, a political censorship basis. Um, the only other thing that I think is regrettable is that Ed, when asked, kind of assumed responsibility. I think his answer to a question which then became public was, uh, well, if there is some connection, I guess I have to take the responsibility because I talked. Well, I don't think that was a wise thing for him to say personally because I think it gives credibility to those people who say that people who speak out have, will suffer the consequences. I frankly don't think that's true. I don't think that, uh, that the, I, there are certainly narrow-minded people in this country, but I don't think that they possess one fraction of the power that they claim they do. And uh, the people in the business I know are in it and operate it as a business, and they don't tell me what to talk about and what not to talk about, and there has never been any, any indication that any job I do or will continue to do has anything to do with my political activities. Yes? The um, Catholic Church has been involved in Central America for some centuries. Uh, the Protestant Church has been involved in there in recent years. What exists in Honduras today among the refugees is a, uh, is a struggle between the Catholic, the Latin Catholic Church is on an unofficial basis committed to what is now known as the theology of liberation. Uh, they believe that working with the poor toward a manifestation of the dignity of humankind is their job. And as a result of that, the Latin Catholic Church has been labeled as communist by most of the authoritarian regimes down there. The Protestant churches have been doing the same thing. Uh, there is now a wave of evangelical Protestant churches who equate Christianity with anti-communism. And they have been doing uh, what I consider to be divisive work down there in that they have uh, bought the line that says the Catholics and the peasants who, who subscribe to, the, to Catholicism and subscribe to the notion of the dignity of the humankind are, are in fact communists. They have been actively working and trying to convert those people to a specifically anti-communist Christianity, which I think is uh, uh, unfortunate. And uh, they have in some instances aligned themselves with uh, retrograde and oppressive political powers. That is not to say that all evangelical Protestant churches are of that ilk, but there are certain ones that have been involved in that kind of activity, and I think it's an unfortunate uh, um, manifestation of any kind of religious uh, belief. But certainly anyone who believes in religion, believes in the dignity of, of people, uh, has a place down there, because to these people, their religion is their, is, is their daily life. Yes? Well, they were originally people who came from outside who are now have, having made some conversions dealing with some, uh, some of the indigenous people. Yes? Um, I'll show you. There's a, the question was, what was my most touching experience? There's a man named Ed Scholl who uh, lives in Laguna Beach. He's in his probably mid-20s, and he's, I think, a graduate of UCLA's uh, public health school who teaches, um, among other things, uh, reading and writing to kids from the age of 5 to 10 in, these ca in this particular camp, Mesa Grande. And uh, in getting to know them, he said to them, draw me a picture of home. And he showed me some of the pictures he got, uh, many of which were simply rude drawings of huts. And two of them were ones I asked him for and made copies of. I'll hold them up. Two separate children drew these pictures of their homes with American-made helicopters over them, dropping bombs on them, and soldiers shooting machine guns into them. These, they, they drew these out of their own experience. In one instance, there's a dead child lying in the front yard. In another instance, there's a dead adult lying in the front yard. And they described them as being when their home was bombed and when the militia came and shot into their home and killed one little girl's uncle. She's the picture depicts the little girl standing in the doorway, watching. Uh, 
I can't look at this without being near tears, and I've looked at it a number of times. It is, to me, symbolic of all that's wrong with our policy down there. Those helicopters are ours. Those people were trained to fly those helicopters by us. The, the soldiers that attack, that, that are most vicious in their attacks, the Atlacatl Battalion in El Salvador, is trained by the United States advisors. All in the, in the, in the guise, it's not the guise, they believe it, all in the, uh, in the furtherance of anti-communism. We've got to get out from under this suffocating notion that our, that our, that our role in life is to be anti-communist and get somehow beyond that to a place where we can understand that people are what's important. Is there another question? Yes. Hunger is a sexy issue now. Uh, I'm, the question is how did I get involved in the issue of hunger? I'm not sure I am involved in the issue of hunger as such. Uh, I am, uh, as a result of seeing a film on children in Asia, I became involved with an organization called CONCERN, which is a, an international, non-denominational, non-government connected refugee aid organization based in Ireland, which has an American branch and an English branch. Uh, two years ago, I traveled to the Asian refugee camps where CONCERN has programs and where one of your students uh, uh, who was in the audience um, was working. I saw people dying of starvation, and I saw people dying of bullet wounds, and it didn't matter which they were dying from. They were still dying. So what, I, what I'm doing in, my, in connection with this organization is trying to see to it that people understand that there are people in the third world and in the first world, as one of the earlier questioners indicated, who are not allowed to live out their lives in some instances because of things we can do something about. I think in most instances, because of things we can do something about. Yes? Um, the question is, can concern or a group like concern get the th things to the people without interference? Um, concern has been very effective in that it is not an organization that takes money from people and sends it somewhere, uh, buying supplies and then hoping that it'll get through the bureaucracy. Concern sends volunteers, and with the volunteers come money and come supplies. So it's a, it's a first-hand organization. It's there on the scene. Uh, there certainly have been any number of cases over the years of uh, graft and corruption in relief agencies, and I think that's the premise that your question is based on. I'm not here to defend those relief agencies. I'm here to talk about the problem and to tell you that concern is one that does not suffer from that problem. Yes? Well, it kind of depends on which media you read. Uh, I've been labeled, labeled a supporter of the Soviet Union and a left-wing activist by some media, and uh, I've been labeled, labeled as a humanitarian by others, so there are certainly editorial opinions that to come into play. I think the problem with it is it's too impersonal. Uh, some, of the, some of the news is accurate. I, for the most part, it's probably uh, an attempt at accuracy, but it's so impersonal. It's a little like having seen the Vietnam War on your television set. You know, it's, it's a picture of somebody, and it's not really some, something for some reason that we connect with. Uh, I talked to a man who is the uh, new, uh, Latin correspondent for the Washington Post when I was down there. And he's a terribly courageous man who's very bright and has a very good sense of, of the, the, the political and social ramifications of our policy and the Latin policies, who has put his life in danger any number of times. I think, that's, I think what he writes is, uh, is uh, something we should pay attention to. His name is Chris Dickey. I think there are other correspondents down there doing the same courageous kind of work. Um, I, think, I think, though, you have to understand that a lot of what comes out as news comes from our State Department and is their particular point of view. Uh, what I'm here to tell you is their particular point of view is just that. It's a point of view. 
And some of us who have been there have a very different point of view about what's going on. Yes? Well, the struggle has always been for some years is a question of consciousness, uh, a question of letting people understand that there, is, there are alternative points of view. Uh, I'm not so sure, well, I don't want to get into labels, but uh, there are some very forthright, courageous people in Congress today who are doing just that. And it's a, it's a question of letting people know that. Subscribe. There are a lot of organizations around that are putting out good information. About El Salvador, there's an organization called CISPES that I mentioned, and Medical Aid for El Salvador, and I'm sure a couple of others. About Nicaragua, there's Casa Nicaragua here in Los Angeles. Um, there are books being written by people who have been on the scene and by people who uh, are good observers. Um, just like, for example, in the nuclear area, the, you, if you want information that doesn't come out of the NRC, you can go to the Uni Union of Concerned Scientists or uh, the Physicians for Social Responsibility. There are growing numbers of organizations that are around of concerned individuals, just like you and me. And it's a question of seeking them out. The Mary Knoll uh, organization, the Catholic uh, missionary organization, is very heavily involved in, in Latin America and uh, puts out a, uh, a magazine. Yes? The elections in El Salvador, in my estimation, were a farce. Uh, they, uh, there were no left-of-center organizations or candidates allowed on the ballot. Um, the uh, UNGO, Guillermo UNGO, who is the figure, uh, the, the uh, leader of the Frente, uh, called them a reorganization of the right. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, Dabuisson got 29% of the vote, I asked a number of people down there about, and they said a lot of people were scared. A lot of people said, I was afraid if I didn't vote for him, I'd, you know, I'd be killed. Or talking about either themselves having personal experience in there or their relatives in there. Uh, some of it is represented by, according to uh, a man uh, who is conversant with the culture, said there is a, there is a sense in Latin America of caudillismo, leaders, strong leaders. Dabuisan is, is portrayed as a strong man. And... He says he'll solve the problems. There are people who will vote for him because he says he'll solve the problems. It doesn't have anything to do with ideology. But what we've got now is the American policy having committed, having been committed to backing up a regime that, is, uh, that has underwritten a murderer, a madman, described by our ex-ambassador um, down there as a pathological killer. Uh, the man, this uh, Managa, I believe his name is, who's the head of the uh, Constituent Assembly now, is, first of all, according to my information, one of the oligarchy, one of the, one of the 16 families that, uh, that ruled El Salvador for so many years, and is no more powerful a figure than was Duarte or anybody else, and probably is even more willing to be working hand-in-hand -hand with Dobuisson. The fact is, we, ha we created those elections. I mean, we said to them they had to have them, and we said to them that, uh, you know, if they come out the way we want them to, we'll support you. And now we're stuck. I don't know how Reagan's going to back away from that, but I don't think we can continue in good conscience to support those people. I'm sorry? You can relate to that. Okay, yes. Did Dave leave? I guess he did. As I understand it, uh, a great number of the refugees from Campuchia uh, who came out have gone back into the country. Uh, there is still strife in the country between Pol Pot and uh, the uh, Vietnamese, as well as strife between the Khmer Sarai and the Khmer Rouge. Pol Pot is the leader of the Khmer Rouge, the so-called Red Khmers or Communist uh, Khmers. The Khmer Sarai is the right-wing group of the, of the Campuchians. And the Vietnamese, as you know, are the Vietnamese. Our government took a position in opposition to the Vietnamese and in spite of the reams of information about the genocidal activities of the Pol Pot regime continues to support him. Uh, Pol Pot still maintains control of a certain amount of land in the country and the strife continues. 
but it is much calmer now than it was uh, when he was in control of the total country and uh, due to that calm and because of the fact that they were living under adverse conditions in Thai camps uh, I think the vast majority of the refugees have gone back and tried to reinstitute some kind of uh, uh, farming uh, work in their in their country but according to a uh, a report I recently read by an American Friends Service Committee observer, it's, uh, it's really to the, down to the rudimentary level of existence there now just because of the, of the extraordinary level of, uh, of devastation that was, uh, that was visited on those people. And uh, Paul Potts evidently his express desire was to wipe out the entire middle class so that what he would have is a, an agrarian class and the military class. Um, so it was an ugly situation, and they go back to very little, but it is theirs, and I'm sure there is a great uh, emotional desire to return and sort of reestablish their society. Yes, sir. I'm not interested in blackmail under any circumstances. I think we can, in short, and I don't speak for any organization when I say that. That's my just my reaction to your question. Yes. Well, the history of this of the Latin American countries is that uh, our government goes where business follows where business leads. Um, I have in here somewhere a quote by uh, Howard, William Howard Taft, president uh, who pretty much installed uh, the Marines in Nicaragua about the fact that the, the, it's kind of an egregiously uh, racist comment about our superior race being in sort of a position of beneficence with these people. Uh, if you saw a recent CBS uh, uh, report on, uh, I've forgotten what they call it, Central American Revolt, I think they called it, there was, a, there was a, um, an interview with a, an American businessman in Guatemala now who spoke the business line to the degree of almost self-parody. It was awful to listen to this man talking about what a great place this was for American business to come to because the people would work for nothing and they, didn't, they were ignorant and they didn't care about themselves and uh, we can make tremendous profits here and all we have to do is live with armed guards all the time just in case some of the dirty commies come try and get us. Uh, I don't think that's required. I don't think business means anti-human activity. I think you can have compassionate businessmen or people, I should say, uh, you can have uh, ethical uh, capitalism. You can have uh, uh, responsible capitalism. But that certainly hasn't been our experience in, uh, in the third world. Yes? Well, a concern doesn't have any political involvement, so it doesn't deal strictly with that. Some of the pe same people who work in those areas, uh, Dr. Cody that I mentioned, who's here in your public health school, is one of the foremost spokespeople against the Nestle Company's tactics uh, with regard to infant formula. Uh, you find a dovetailing or an overlapping of interest in people who are interested in the third world simply because once you get there, you see the extraordinary amount of work to be done and there just isn't any way around it. And I think those, I think those concerns overlap anyway. Yes, sir. Well, I, I, I can't say that I was witness to enough of, you, of it to give you a, an educated answer to that. I do know that by the people who came out, the refugees in the camps, it was considered to be a kind of payoff to members of the paramilitary organizations rather than, in fact, a way to divide up the land fairly to the, to the workers. 
Uh, there is now, I understand, under this new government, an, an attempt to uh, strip the machinery, to take away even that kind of minuscule effort toward land reform. I'm, I think that's it, folks. Thank you for coming out. And I'd like to remind you that this Thursday there's a fast day here at UCLA, and if um, you could give up a meal or two and give the money that you would have spent and bring the money to 304 Kirkhoff, um, we'd appreciate anything you could give us. And there's a movie tomorrow at 1 o'clock in Ackerman 3517. Thank you.